I would say for the first four years of living out here, every single year, Berkey said, I'm moving home this year. I'm moving home this year. And it, this is my last year in Vegas. This is my last year in Vegas. And it became like a theme. Like, okay, here's when Berkey says he's moving back to Pittsburgh, but never does. Five bedroom house, and it was on the website, it was like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And you show up, and it's, you know, it's a real deal. It's got vaulted ceilings, it's got places where we could just, you know, put a pool table and all kinds of stuff. So it was way different than the shithole that we lived in Erie. I think the four of us shared a three bedroom, like two floor apartment, and it was. It was just tiny and it was just, you know, dreary. So just getting into Vegas and seeing the it's just 75 degrees and sunny every day and you could be in the pool in the middle of February, that was phenomenal. The only thing Berkey hated us for was that he didn't have the master bedroom and being the alpha Berkey likes to be, uh, he was very upset about that for the entire year or two years we lived there. I was terribly homesick for the first year or two that I was living out here. Honestly, it felt like freshman year of college all over again. I, you know, the, the level of social awkwardness uh, at that age too, being like 25, 26 years old, you just don't know where the hell you fit into the world. What am I supposed to wear again? Like, am I too old for Hollister and Abercrombie? Is Buckle the new place to go? Like, there were a lot of awkward outfits. There were some Affliction t-shirts that may have been ordered. Just in general, you're gonna get homesick. It you know, it's very different here from where we live. Pittsburgh's a very unique place. It's hard to leave and stay completely away from. Throughout all that time, it's like I had been quote unquote poker broke a bunch of times. Uh, me paying rent was always a struggle. My only concern was could he afford it? You know, like any career, you have career related expenses and professional poker player probably has some of the highest. He would do whatever it takes to make some money. Just a couple hundred bucks here and there. We had a bunch of friends like that, Dylan and Pete and Berkey, they would always do stuff for Brent. Brent would throw out these random shit, like, hey, I don't want to do it, who wants it? And then they'd be like, I do, I do. And they'd go drive down and cash his ticket to the South Point or something. Berkey was like, oh, I miss Pittsburgh and I miss my friends. And we did make we did make friends out here. As soon as we moved out here, we met Dan O'Brien and, and Andy Zuzolo. I have a nasty competitive streak. And there is just some level of like, fuck you mentality when I sit down at a table. I can't imagine how developing friendships from that is like ever beneficial. Him and I hit it off immediately. Like I loved poker, but it wasn't something that I was gonna do for a living. Uh, like playing wise, so we didn't like talk hand histories and things like that. Like that's just my least favorite thing to do with him. You know, when you run around in the same circles with the same people, you, you, you can't avoid becoming friends with poker players, so you have to choose the right ones. I redistributed all of Chin's chips. You're all welcome. Yeah, I'm up 20. Dollars? Yeah. When you live in the streets for that long, people start figuring you out, you know? When you teach half the table your strategy, it doesn't seem to work quite as well. Queens. That's my move. I honestly have no self moves. They're all yours. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm being serious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the button limp three-handed is definitely one that I don't want to take credit for. You, you can own that one. That's a player shot. profile adjustment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing I didn't think I'd ever hear. Obviously, I don't have a real hand. Clearly, I'm going to be leading this academy yeah. soon. I should <laughs> They're just spews. Did you guys catch the hand where I just like stacked them both at the same time? Fantastic hand, Christian. If I get this distribution, I play the big game. They're all in big, big trouble. Yeah, you're playing great, Bert. <laughs> Oh man, man, it's it's just insane how much someone. How I don't know. You're gonna say, "Oh, you got chirping chips." I know. You're so predictable. Oh, same guy. Listen. <laughs> so predictable. Same guy, whether he's winning or losing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Same guy. I mean, that's what I like about him. Yeah. Nothing. Just his his stoicness. <laughs> oh, a, all right, fine. I don't know. You just want to pick on. Him. Trying to gamble, man. You want chips? Well, I mean, you want no. cash? No, I'm running this up. <laughs> I don't even know how much cash I even have in here left. I'm playing the cap game webinar right now. How do I give 400 to fucking George? It was closer to five, actually. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cute. Aww. Aww. 
Well, I don't know that's what that was. Being, you know, that's binding. Well, I give him my hand back. I'll play for all of it. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even just Vegas where sobriety became kind of a hindrance. It's adulthood. It's very strange. Like the drunk guy who's creepy and drooling and whatever is is welcome like she thinks that i'm some sort of like psychopath because i have to have a history if i obviously am choosing not to drink we had to explain that to a lot of people like no berkey's never had a sip of alcohol he's never done anything since we've met him berkey was never a club guy and and somehow we ended up going to the clubs more often than we should have the alcohol thing we never talk about like it's just like almost a non-existent issue. Like he's probably maybe had issues with it. Everybody always wanted to be the initiator of like, I'm gonna buy you a hooker or I'm gonna get you drunk. My rebuttal just became a laugh and a like, the list is long and you're at the end, buddy. Having Bricky as a yeah. DD is definitely nice. Um, but yeah, also having him remind us of the stupid shit we did the night before. Trust me, I have a lot of LaManna stories that he fucking hates me for it. I'm so glad there was no such thing as an iPhone back then because Berkey would have been taking videos of Lamana doing the weirdest shit that you can imagine. <laughs> we went to the club at Palms one night and he just got blacked the fuck out. And we come home, it's 6 a.m., we all decide to get in the hot tub and somehow Lamana ends up in there naked. So of course, we take his swim trunks and we lock him out. We're laughing and he's standing with his crotch covered like, okay guys, you have jokes over, yada, yada, yada. We're in tears. So, so it finally dawns on him that like, oh, well he can come in through the garage. Cause he knows the code. So he runs out front at 7 a.m. People are going to work. He's stark naked, sneaking into our garage like a madman. Tries to come through the door. We have it locked. Finally, Brent lets him in and he just bull rushes him, slams Brent through the wall. I would tend to do, you know, some foolish things that I would just forget about. And then the next morning, I'd wake up and he'd tell me everything I did. And I said, oh man, what was I thinking? I can't tell you how often on a date, just being like, yeah, you know, I've never drank in my life. And the response is like, never a sip? It's like, yeah, never a sip. And you're like, okay, this is gonna go well. And they're just like, I really respect that. And it's like, oh, that took a turn. And then, <laughs> You know, it just becomes like, uh, are okay? so are you okay if, if I order a drink? And it's like, oh Christ, like this is just spiraled out of control. Like now she's the exact opposite of comfortable. When Tinder came up and uh, Bumble and all those things, like, I mean, he would go on a first date every day. And it was always like to a coffee shop or tropical smoothie. And honestly, it happens with food a lot too, where it's like, what do you mean you don't like this decadent thing. And it's like, I don't know, I have a pretty plain palate. Like, I like meat and potatoes. And it's like, oh, you don't like sushi? We, we, we just can't even talk. It's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> Berkey's diet, it's like a daily conversation topic. He will tell everyone to this day that he's 13 weeks clean of sugar, which is bullshit. <laughs> For the most part, Berkey's only vice is gambling. You know, he doesn't do the rest of the stuff that we all did on the weekends. Um, and he would play the games that made sense, but at the same time, he knew that there was a lot of opportunity to make money out here. Not a lot has changed with how I approach risk, but a ton has changed with my purpose. And I just didn't have one back then. My favorite broke Berkey moment uh, is definitely the time where we all ran an RV to go camping in Tahoe and he didn't have the money to pay so we told him, alright, you just have to drive us there and back. I happily agreed, couldn't wait, I missed camping, I missed things from home, and I honestly didn't know what the hell I was going to do with the rest of my life. So I drive this 36 foot bus basically. And we get to a point where we're literally driving on what looks like a cartoon mountain where it just spirals around and the road is literally the width of the car. He had to drive through these narrow mountain passage roads, you know, gripping the steering wheel with construction on one side and a cliff on the other. These guys are smoking weed in the back, pounding fucking 40s, just like living the goddamn life. And I'm just miserably beside myself like, it's not worth it. If I took it over the side of the hill right now, it would be way more worth it than what I'm getting paid to do this. Yeah, he cursed us and hated us, but he knew if he wanted to go, that that's what we're gonna make him do. 
At that point, I never wanted to be the charity case again. He would spend time when we were out and doing stuff, he'd be studying, or you know, after his sessions, he'd be talking hand histories where we just wanted to you know, go to the club or go drink some beers and stuff. For me, it was how can I close the gap between me and Phil Ivey any given day. Berkey was the one that took the poker career the most serious. I parlayed it into a local 510 game where I'd won like 50K in two and a half months playing that game. I think he really kind of saw the future of poker is you have to work harder than everyone else in the community, not just in your circle. Had a big score to start the summer for about 45,000 in the nation. All of a sudden I had six figures for the first time ever. And then I make a deep run in the main event. It's just like, how is this happening?